Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our first presenter on perfecting your dough is Ricardo Rodriguez. He is the technical services manager for La Safre East since, not, since 2014, not 19. My goodness, I'm getting old. Ricardo provides training and helps bakeries troubleshoot production issues, along with having 42 years of industry experience. Thank you. Everybody, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about, this is part of a larger seminar that we do normally. I don't know if any of you has ever attended the, the National Pizza Show in, in Las Vegas. Um, normally at the National Pizza Show, we do this training and it's, it's almost like a two hour training course. We're not, it's not going to be that long today. We've kind of condensed it a little bit and we're going to be focusing on ingredients for pizza dough. So how many of you actually uh, make pizza dough? You do, okay. So hopefully today um, you'll get some good information to help you t with your pizza dough. Um, as you know, baking um, is a little bit more of a science than, than cooking. Um, I'm hopefully today, I'm not gonna get too sciencey on you. But basically what we're going to be doing is going through your basic uh, pizza dough ingredients and kind of give you an idea of what is it that they do and help you maybe uh, troubleshoot any, any issues that you might have. So a little bit about LaSaf. Um, we are the largest uh, producer of yeast in the world. Um, we've been, uh, we have over 165 years, it's a family owned business. The LaSaf family actually owns the company, that's where the name comes from. Here in the U.S., um, we are headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we have our, our headquarters are in Milwaukee. We have several baking centers. Uh, we have the largest uh, fresh yeast plant in the world is actually located in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And we have another plant in Dothan, Alabama that produces some of our specialty uh, cream yeast. <clears throat> so, Primary ingredients, when we talk about pizza dough, you have some primary ingredients, which flour, salt, and yeast. And then you have some optional ingredients, which are sugar and oil. So, <clears throat> when we talk about the first one, which is flour. Flour basically provides structure to the dough. It uh, provides extensibility or stretch and it also provides gas retention, and that's important because that's what's gonna give you that rise, that volume in, in your pizza dough, depending on what type of pizza dough you guys are producing. So when we look at flours, there's several different types of flours. You have all-purpose flour, bread flour, and high-gluten flour. The main difference is, is the protein level. Um, so in all-purpose flour, we're talking about 10 to 12% protein. Bread flour has 12 to 13. And high gluten flour usually has 13 to 14% uh, gluten. Uh, that's important because gluten is what's gonna give you strength, but it's also gonna give you chew. So the higher the gluten, usually the chewier your bite and your pizza is, is going to be. Um, the, the absorption, which is the amount of water that it holds, is also going to be influenced by the amount of protein. If so, if you look at the table, uh, an all-purpose flour, you're looking at 48 to 52 percent. That's baker's percent of water, whereas a high-gluten flour, you're, at, you're looking at 55 to 60 percent of water. And I'll get, are you familiar with baker's percent? You are? Okay. I'm going to I'm going to get into that in a couple slides. So your all-purpose flour is your general use flour. Um, 
it's good because it's it gives you acceptable results over a wide range of baked products, especially pizza. It minimizes dough shrinkage because since it's lower in protein, the protein is going to give you strength, but the protein is also going to give you more elasticity when you try to stretch that that dough ball and it shrinks back. The, usually the higher the protein you have in your flour, the more shrinkage you're, you're going to have. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so an all-purpose flour, since it's, it's lower in protein, it's going to give you a more, a more tender bite. Remember what I said at the beginning, that high gluten flour, the higher the protein, the chewier the bite. The other way around is the lower the protein, you have a more tender bite in your, in your crust. Um, it's also suitable for deep dish pizza, and it's used uh, in cracker crow, uh, in cracker crust style pizza. The next one um, is the high gluten flour, which is more tolerant because of the protein. It's more tolerant to mixing, more tolerant to fermentation and, and machining. Um, it develops a crispier crust with a chew, as I mentioned before, and it minimizes soakage of sauce into the crust preserving the desired crispiness. Um, it's recommended for thin crust pizzas. Bread flour is an excellent go to go in between flour. Um, the benefits are a greater dough tolerance over an all-purpose flour and a softer mouthfeel than a high gluten flour. A good choice for a traditional style pizza but can be stretched to make a good thin crust as well. Then you have the whole wheat flour. Um, whole wheat flour, as you know, is milled from 100% of the wheat kernel. Uh, whole wheat flour is considered a whole grain food. Uh, it adds flavor and texture to pizza. Uh, usage level says 20 to 40 of total flour, but you can go as low as 5, 10% of your flour. But you gotta be careful because it does, redu it does reduce your, your dough strength. So, what happens with whole wheat flour is the, the particle size tend to be bigger, and as you mix, they kind of shear the dough, the gluten, and weaken your structure. So that's something, if you are using whole wheat flour, that's something to, to keep in mind. Water would be our next ingredient, and the main function of water is hydration. It adds as a solvent, so it dissolves all the ingredients. Um, it also is, what, is a, what controls your, your temperature. So if you want to control your dough temperature, um, water, you play around with the, with the temperature of your water. We have two baking centers. One is in Milwaukee, the other one is in New Jersey. And when we run doughs, test doughs in our, in our labs, we use water, the, the, we play around with the dough temperature um, to control our, our we, 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 contro we play around with the, sorry, with the water temperature to control our final dough temperature. What we've seen for, what works for us, for example, if you're shooting for 78, 82 dough temperature and your finished dough, we temper our water to about 55 degrees. And with the friction that's creating during the mix, that gives us a dough around 78 and 82. As you know, that's important because that's how you control your fermentation as well. And we'll get a little bit into that when we talk about yeast. So typically in, in, in pizza dough, water is used at 45 to 65 percent, depending on the type of pizza that you're going to be making. Salt. Uh, salt's main purpose is flavor. Flavor enhancer, I don't know if you've ever forgotten to add salt to a dough. It has, tastes like cardboard, very, doesn't taste very good. It proofs very fast. Uh, if you forget to you put your salt, because you have n another function of salt is to control the rate of fermentation in the yeast. So when usually when you forget to add salt, that that dough is going to rise very quickly because it has nothing controlling the yeast. 
And also, salt has another important function that it strengthens the gluten. Um, again, if you've ever forgotten to add salt to your dough, I don't know if you remember, but it's, it tends to be very sticky. The dough tends to be very sticky because, again, salt helps strengthen the gluten. And typically in, in pizza dough, salt is used at anywhere between 1% to 2%. Sugar um, serves as a food for yeast. Yeast likes sugar. It feeds off of sugar. Um, it helps with the browning of the crust. And it also helps with the, the keeping quality of the pizza once, once it's baked. Um, usage level, typically not every pizza dough, not everybody adds sugar uh, to a pizza dough, but it does average, if you do want, you're looking at uh, up to 5% um, is what we recommend of sugar in your pizza dough, if you want to add sugar. Um, oil shortening. Main function is lubrication. Uh, it also helps with the extensibility, which is something that you want in your pizza, especially when you go from the pizza dough ball to stretch it out, you want extensibility. You do not want, you want a little bit of elasticity. So when you, when you talk about a dough, there's two things we look for. Um, extensibility, which is the ability to stretch and not pull back. And you have elasticity, which is kind of the opposite, which is when you stretch, it, it pulls back. So oil helps with the extensibility part of the dough, makes it easier to stretch. Um, it does have some browning effect, especially oil. Um, it does impart tenderness to your, to your pizza, and it also helps with the, uh, with the keeping quality. And usage levels, again, it varies, but it can be anywhere from no oil to 14% of oil or shortening in your pizza dough. Yeast. So yeast provides the leavening action. It's what's going to make your pizza dough rise. Um, it also conditions the dough and it helps develop, uh, develop the flavor and the aroma. Um, it helps with the development of the dough as well. So when you talk about talk, when you think about fermented foods. Think about things that you like and things that are fermented. Um, think of bread, think of pizza dough, think of spirits, whiskey, vodka, distilled spirits. Think of beer. What do they all have in common? They have yeast and they're fermented. So fermentation is what gives you flavor. In bread, gives you flavor in pizza, in pizza dough. And usually the longer the fermentation, the better the flavor. Um, if you, if you, I don't know if you've ever baked a pizza dough with no fermentation, with very short fermentation, doesn't have a lot of flavor to it. So pizza, um, yeast is key, obviously, for flavor in pizza dough. So when we talk about yeast, keep in mind that yeast is a living organism. It's actually... It's actually a fungus. Um, there's about 2,000 different species of, 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 of yeast strains. In baking, the one that we use, it's called Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae, and it's the most commonly one used in, in baking and, and other applications. But as a living organism, keep in mind um, it's affected by dough temperature, so um, yeast starts dying at about 130 degrees. So I've had people, I've run to people all the time when I wear my, my La Safra Red Star shirt, and they, a lot of, especially home bakers, recognize the, the Red Star logo. And they'll say, oh, hey, I use your, your yeast, but it didn't work. And I'm like, okay, so work me through your process. What did you do? So you know that some of these yeasts, especially like dry active yeast, you bloom it or you basically you rehydrate it in warm water. Um, and usually what they do is they rehydrate it, but in hot water. Hot water, as you know, we're talking about 200 degrees. 
So I explained to them, well, you're, you know, when you rehydrate it in hot water, you're basically killing it. So that's why you didn't get any rise. So there's several, let me go back. I think I jumped a slide. Uh, several types of yeast used in pizza crust, IDY or instant yeast, which is our saff red. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. Um, active dry yeast was the first generation of dry yeast came out back in, developed around war, World War II. Active dry yeast needs to be, is the one that needs to be rehydrated in warm water. Uh, you have compressed yeast. Compressed yeast is also known as fresh yeast or black yeast. And then you have a deactivated yeast or inactive dry yeast, which is used not for its fermentation, but, it, but it's used to help give your dough more ex extensibility, make it easier to stretch. So when we talk about instant yeast, um, it's dried yeast. It dissolves quickly during your mixing. Uh, you can add it with your dry ingredients. No need to rehydrate it. And it gives you a consistent activity. And you see the, if you see on the bottom, you see the conversion rates for typically for, for dry versus compressed and active yeast. Active dry yeast, which we are known for our Red Star active dry yeast, that's what you see also in grocery stores, that was the first generation of dry yeast that came out, like I mentioned earlier, around 1940s, 1950s. Um, this one needs to be rehydrated in warm water, 100 to 110 degrees. Um, live and dead uh, cells are present, and it's gonna give you more of a yeasty flavor. Compressed yeast, do any of you use compressed yeast by any chance? You use it instant active is what you're using? Okay. Compressed yeast is used a lot in bakeries. I don't see it, uh, I don't see it too much in, in pizza, uh, unless it's a, like, a larger wholesale operation. But compressed yeast is also known as wet and fresh yeast. Um, it needs to be uh, stored and refrigerated, needs to be refrigerated. Uh, shelf life is much, uh, shorter than your dry yeast. Um, it's perishable, but the big advantage, it doesn't need to be uh, rehydrated because it does contain about 70% about water. So this one you just add to your dough and you do not need to, to rehydrate it. So inactive dry yeast, also known as deactivated, deactivated yeast, is non-leavening. Um, what we do is we take live yeast, we, remember, like I said before, when you heat it over 130, yeast starts to die. Well, what we do is we heat it to about 200 degrees and we kill it. And what happens is the yeast cells die, they release uh, something called glutathione, which is a natural uh, reducing agent. So deactivated yeast, you add a little bit to your dough if you're looking um, to improve the, the extensibility of your dough. If you have a very tight dough, which is difficult to stretch, by adding a little bit of deactivated yeast, you can actually make that dough ball very easy to stretch. And the usage level is between half a percent to one percent. So what affects yeast activity? The amount of yeast, obviously, the more yeast you use, the faster your dough is going to move on you, right? Uh, the yeast strain, this is more for, depending on what you're making, um, if you're making frozen pizza dough balls, um, we would recommend that you do not use dry yeast. We would recommend that you use fresh yeast, actually, for frozen dough. Um, so the strain is important as well. The temperature, as I mentioned before, a warmer, hotter dough is going to move quicker than a colder dough, uh, your fermentation time, and the amount of sugar and salt in your recipe is also going to influence your rate of fermentation. 
So typical ranges for your average uh, pizza recipe, we're talking about 100 pounds of flour, between 45 to 60 pounds of, of, of water, one to up to two and a half pounds of salt, um, up to five pounds of sugar, uh, up to 14 pounds of oil shortening or a combination of both. Then again, depending on what type of pizza you're, you're, you're making. And yeast, depending on the type of yeast and how long of a fermentation or if you're retarding your dough in a cooler, um, you're going to be looking at 0.25 to 3% yeast. So everybody, I guess everybody is familiar with Baker's percent? Yes? No? So normally, in the baking industry, we use something called Baker's percent. When we talk about conventional percent, it's what we call 100%, where if you have a recipe, you, all the, the addition of all the ingredients is always going to be 100%. If you add them all up, it's always going to be, they're going to be in percentages, but they're always going to add up to 100%. Am I in the right? Oop, sorry. Now, in Baker's Percent, we do it a little bit different. In Baker's Percent, we're always going to use the flour as the main ingredient. Why? Because it's it's, it's, of all your ingredients, what's the most you use in any given recipe? It's flour. So flour is always going to be 100% of your recipe. And what you do is you take all the other ingredients and you divide it by your amount of flour. And that number is going to give you your baker's percent. So I think I have an example. So if you look at this, at this table right here, we have 25 pounds of flour. Right? So in true percent, look at the true percent column. If you add up those ingredients, and by the way, I, my e I'll give you my email, and I can email you a copy of this presentation. So, I mean, you're more than welcome to take pictures if you want. But if you see, if you see the true percent column, that is your 100%. See, if you add up those ingredients at the bottom, you get 100%, right? Now, if you look at the baker's percent, the last column on your right, those are baker's percent. So you see how the flour is 100%. We look at the water. So if you take uh, and you divide 14 by 25, you're going to get 56. So that means you have 56% water ba in baker's percent. And if you do th the same thing with all the other ingredients, you're going to get those numbers on that last column on the right. So the beauty of the baker's percent is be Once you know your baker's percent, you can basically make that recipe as big or as small as you want. Instead of cutting by halves, which is what most people do, like if they have a recipe that calls for 25 pounds of flour and they want to do half, they can do, they'll do, what, 12 and a half pounds of flour and then they'll cut everything in half. But let's say you want to do, you just want to use 15 pounds of flour. What do you do now? With baker's percent, that's the beauty of the baker's percent. You could take that 15 divided by your baker's percent and it'll give you the exact same amount of each ingredient. So I highly encourage you to learn baker's percent. It's not, it's not that difficult and it's going to make your, your life easier, trust me. So going through, I'm going to talk to uh, some basic dough formulas here. Um, this is based on our experience. Uh, processing will make a difference, uh, equipment. This is a good starting point. So for a, a New York thin pizza, um, we recommend you go with high gluten flour. And if you look at the column, those are some of the ingredients in Baker's Percent for that specific type of crust. Same thing goes for bread, for, for, um, for a pan pizza, which is the third column, deep dish pizza, and the last column on the, on the right is a cracker. We would recommend you go with an all-purpose. Um, and you look at the water, the water is, you're only looking at 50% water in a cracker. So it's a very, it's a fairly stiff dough. Um, salt is, 
average is about one and a half to two on all of them. Sugar, if you notice on the cracker, tends to be a little bit higher than on a New York thin style pizza. Oil, the, the highest amount is gonna be in your deep dish. And instant yeast, um, on your pan pizza and cracker are gonna have your highest amount of, of yeast. These are, I mean, basic formulas. If you've ever uh, thought about doing different styles of pizza, this is a good, a good point, a good starting point for some recipes. And for a wheat style pizza, if you've ever done wheat style, wheat, uh, <clears throat> whole wheat pizza, um, this is a nice starting uh, formula. It's got 10 pounds of whole wheat flour, 15 pounds of high gluten. See the water, the water's gonna be higher because whole wheat does absorb more water than white wheat, than regular wheat. Um, salt, eight ounces, honey. You can use honey or sugar. Just keep in mind that honey is not as sweet as sugar. Honey's about 80, has about 80% the sweetness of sugar. So if you use honey, you're gonna have to use a little bit more to achieve the same sweetness as if you were using sugar. Well, the reason we have sugar, uh, honey in this recipe is because honey does, in our experience, does a better job of masking some of that, that whole wheat flour tends to give your dough a little bit of a bitter flavor. So we find that honey does a little better job of masking some of that bitterness that you get from the whole wheat flour.